Hello, my name's John Thorne. I'm the GSA Sustainability Coordinator. I'm an environmentalist and I am a socio-economic development professional. My role at the Glasgow School of Art is to work with students and staff examining social and environmental issues within their practice. This includes the climate and ecological crisis or climate change and social justice issues such as race, gender, sexuality, disability and others. I discuss material use in students' practice and how your future professional work will cause impacts as you design and as you build. My role assists staff with reducing the social and environmental impacts of running a campus and the GSA as a whole. For example, in energy use, recycling, reuse, water use and transport. I'm attached to the architecture school, but GSA Sustainability provides support and advice across the whole of the Glasgow School of Art. The group was formed in 2009 and I've been here since 2013. Any student or staff member can join the sustainability group and help shape sustainability policy and priorities for my work. My time and expertise is available for you for one-to-one -one meetings and for any student and staff to take part in your group projects, to be a critical voice in your projects and to attend student and staff meetings. We have a project funding programme, annual prizes and online resources, including a library of best practice examples. I work a lot with the GSA library and the enterprise and employability manager, for example, but I work widely across the GSA with other professionals and all five schools. To understand what's happening on the planet right now, I think we have to learn some bad news and then we have to learn what we can do as creative people. This is a graph of carbon dioxide over time. Scientists have taken ice cores from the Antarctic and have managed to track CO2 back 800,000 years. As you can see, there's a natural up and down to CO2, around 250 parts per million. The spike starts to go up around 1750 with the British Industrial Revolution. And the orange mark is readings taken from Hawaii volcanoes and we're right up to 411 or so parts per million of CO2 now in the atmosphere. This is completely outside of the natural range and it's a great cause for concern. Climate change is just one of the issues affecting our planet. This is planetary boundaries combined with donut economics and I'll be sharing links to that later. Donut economics says if you provide the right number of resources for people, you live in the sweet spot of the donut. The best part, the bit that tastes good. We have enough water and food. We have enough health and education. We have peace and justice. We have social equity, so everyone has the same opportunity, gender equality. If we don't put enough resources in, we have a shortfall and people don't have enough of those things. If we put in too much, we cause climate change, chemical pollution. We use too much land and we lose biodiversity. So climate change is just one issue I work with students a startling statistic is that 10,000 years ago, of all the mass of mammals on Earth, 1% was humans and what we ate, 99% was wild animals. Now it's completely opposite. 99% is humans and what we eat, and 1% is wild animals. Most of the animals of mammals on Earth now are beef, livestock. We need to change how we eat and how we make meat. Climate change, although caused by Europe and America in the main, is an issue that impacts mainly on countries that don't cause the problem. For example, in India, people have a very low impact on climate, but they are faced with issues like wet bulb temperatures. Unlike standard temperatures, wet bulb temperatures take effect on humans at about 35 degrees. If the temperature is humid and the temperature goes much above 35 degrees, no one can sweat. Even if you're standing under shade with water, you cannot sweat and you die within about six hours. And huge parts of Asia now face this issue over the coming decades. We also face feedback loops. And if any time during this presentation you want more information and you see blue underlined text, you can click on that hyperlink and get more information. This slide talks about feedback loops and we don't yet understand them all. 
but one of the ones we do see happening right now is that Arctic ice is disappearing. White ice that used to reflect light and heat back into space has melted and it's becoming dark seawater which absorbs light, causing more heating and more ice loss, and that is the feedback loop. But there are many feedback loops across the globe, including ones that might stop the Atlantic conveyor which warms Europe at present. This is a complicated story. It's based on, our economy is based on a industry, industrial complex, which includes the military, which is the largest use, user of diesel and petrol in the world. Nuclear power, even civil nuclear power, is linked to nuclear bombs. And some environmentalists think nuclear power is the answer. I'm not so sure, but it will give us some breathing space. A major problem is industrial agriculture with widespread pesticide and fertilizer use, which is poisoning our oceans and our soil. And some scientists say we only have 50 years of soil use left, so we need to change how architecture works. This is all supported by chemistry and the chemical industry, which relies on uh, oil and gas to make chemicals for products we use every day. So it's also a problem about what products we use. Energy use is less of a problem. There's a deep history here as well. This, the picture on the top left is a proud moment in Scottish history when Scottish women demanded the vote. In, and this was taken about 1916. There's been many sad parts of our history and we need to confront empire and colonialism. We have had 500 years of voyages of discovery and exploration, which have caused widespread plunder of resources. And we still live in that era. We need to address that and look at how we can change it. The top right one is a human zoo. Taken in about 1900, this picture shows indigenous people being brought to Coney Island in America to be part of a zoo and people would pay to go and see them. The bottom left is King Leopold II, not taught in European history books, but King Leopold took control of the what is now Democratic Republic of Congo and in the process of taking out rubber for his profit, killed around at least 10 million African people. And we need to confront this history and continue, not make sure we do not continue living like that. Because the results are happening now. This was Glasgow taken a few months ago when the river flooded and our, the cities of the world are now at risk of flooding and 80% of the world lives in coastal cities. So climate change to a lot of people seems like a vague, distant threat. This is perhaps a, an artist's impression of someone maybe 100,000 years ago. And we have the similar kind of brains now, which are good at looking at threats that are coming our way, but more distant threats we have to. So if Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom is running and there's something chasing him, he'll take immediate action. With climate change, the effects are often hidden until it's too late. We have what is called a conflict in our heads where we enjoy something like a very warm winter, but we know it's also wrong. And this is bad for us psychologically. And psychology is a really important part of my work with students. We're also psychologically damaged because we were promised great things. We were promised a Star Trek future. We were promised hoverboards from Back to the Future. And these things haven't appeared. So we're also disappointed at being promised something. And now we seem to have more technology and more things, and yet we're not any happy. It's also very complex. So, and people see a problem in addressing just one part of it because so many things are wrong. But at the GSA, we take a systematic view and the fact that your work, your particular practice can look at one part of the system and help fix it. So just because it's complicated, if it's a wicked problem, what we call a wicked problem, we doesn't mean we can't address individual parts of it and start fixing the issue. But it's quite usual for people day to day to just hide their heads in the sand. And if you click the link here, you'll learn more about denial and the psychological processes behind it. Because it is tough. We are just programmed to really look after ourselves, look after our family and friends, make some money, get a house, get a car. But actually there's a lot more going on in life. Sometimes we just feel anger 
And sometimes we anticipate mourning. We actually feel mourning for the earth we are losing. Sometimes we lose ourselves in virtual reality or Candy Crush on the phone. And sometimes we're just in straight denial. We deny everything is happening. We're also asked to do things which maybe don't have a positive effect. And I am not necessarily in favour of recycling because it takes energy and perhaps we should be thinking about not making the thing in the first place rather than creating another industry around more products. So having discussions about recycling is an interesting way of getting people involved. And here's a link to a video which has a language warning, but really it's George Monbiot who is an interesting commentator to follow and he talks about us being asked to do small things when we really need to look, be looking at the big systems changes. And I believe GSA students are good at looking at the bigger changes we need. Some examples now of art, which I think help because I believe in artists' uh, expertise in helping to communicate problems in our cities and countryside and around the globe. And Carl Jung is, uh, Jung is a Swedish artist and he took away the space that we give to cars and illustrated it like this. So for me, this is a powerful picture of what cities look like if we really realize how much space cars take up. So maybe we need to design cities without cars and give them back to people. Sometimes art makes me laugh. This is Politicians Discussing Climate Change by Isaac Cordell, a Berlin inst installation. And it's politicians discussing climate change as the floodwaters rise. It's an amazing piece of art and it really makes me laugh and then think, it makes me sad and it gives emotional response. And in art and in design, we need to connect to people emotionally because humans are emotional beings. This made me think about giving up fish because if you eat fish, you're responsible for the fishermen and the fishing boats and the fishing nets. And bycatch, those waste bits of nets get caught up in turtles and fish and we cause suffering to fish and turtles if we eat fish. So we need to actually think about what we're doing and artists can help us connect to that. And this has made me think a lot more about how much fish I eat and I've almost stopped eating fish now. This was a campaign by Greenpeace, which as most shampoos, in fact, all shampoos on the high street contain palm oil and nearly all palm oil comes from land cleared of rainforest. So if you wash your hair with head and shoulders, you are basically uh, clearing rainforest, you are burning the Amazon. So it's not the Brazilians that are people that are destroying the rainforest, it's me using shampoo. And this made me stop using shampoo and I switched to a lush shampoo bar, which is, doesn't include palm oil. You also, I think it's important to have beauty in our lives. And this is my screensaver at work. It's sleeping sperm whales from a program called Blue Planet 2. And we should celebrate what we have in the way of wildlife around the planet. Art can also make us think about the future. This is something called human uh, fossils from Heartless Machine. And this was an idea of what fossils may look like in the future. And it's a skeletal hand holding onto a plastic bottle. Do we really want this kind of future? GSA student work now. And Jovana Rajvovic was an architect here. And she's gone on to look at bacterial celluloid buildings. So if you click on the link, you'll learn more about this work. Basically, buildings made from bacteria, they're grown, they make a building, and when you're finished with them, you can scrunch them up and make a new building. Because often buildings, when you knock them down, are just a pile of waste and concrete and glass and steel and no good. But her buildings are instantly reusable. Angela Carposi, again, a link there if you'd like to see more of her work. She was one of the first students I worked with in around 2014, and she made her whole degree show prize work organic. So everything in here is organic. And the amazing thing is it doesn't look environmental. It doesn't look green or uh, not mainstream. It actually looks like good work and it looks like great fashion, but it's all organic. It's good for the planet. We also run Fashion Revolution Week every April and students come together to ask who made my clothes. So actually challenging the fact that as a white European British male, I wear clothing that is made in countries where people are black or Asian and they have bad lives making my clothes. There's actually a social justice issue around me having cheap clothes and we address that and actually make people think about the clothes they wear, value them more, maybe buy less clothes. 
Karen Westland won our sustainability prize a few years ago, and she makes a living now from selling sustainable ethical silver. So the silver she makes is comes from sustainable sources where miners have good conditions and healthcare education for their children. And she sells her work as a, at a premium because of that. So this shows that we can do the right thing and still make uh, a career. So I'm interested in what your future career will be, what your future impacts will be. And Karen Westlands are a lot less because she uses ethical. Morag Seaton won our prize another year. Again, completely ethical clothing. She knew where the materials came from. She knew where the dyes came from. Uh, she made statements with her clothing. And overall, she's made a, a successful career as a fashion designer and now works in the industry. Rosa Giblin was involved with refugees at Calais, at the Calais refugee camps. And she designed this front piece for the Calais canteen, for the kitchen at the refugee camp welcoming them and using art to connect ourselves at the degree show to people in the Calais camps. Alice McCabe took a fire warning label from some polyester clothing and attached it to a picture of a factory fire, recognizing that a lot of clothing we use causes fires in factories in other countries. And we have, um, we have a duty to look at that. We're also involved in things like looking at energy use. So the students on the left here in communication design were looking at how to connect people emotionally to electricity. And they decided to have a list of people who work and study at the GSA. When people came in, they would tick their name and then they would imagine them generating the electricity manually by turning a handle on a generator and generating the electricity for that day and emotionally connecting them to that electricity. So they would have a connection to it and actually value the electricity. And on the right, is throwaway gourmet, a GSA society using food that would have been thrown away, cooking it and serving it to students for free. Josh Hoskin built a built um, a bicycle frame out of flax, so uh, a crop which he processed and then made into a bicycle frame. Cassandra McIntyre, a master's fashion student here, made uh, sustainable fashion using zero waste pattern cutting. And again, if you click on the link, You'll learn more about zero waste pattern cutting where no part of the cloth is wasted when cutting out. Beth Harini used plastic coated wire to make cushions. So this is wire that would normally get thrown away, perhaps end up in landfill. And she spun, she found a way of weaving with it and spun with it and made cushions that last a long time from it. The group also funds Foro's permaculture garden up in our Highland campus because we recognize that well-being is important to students and working with nature and connecting to nature actually helps us be better students and get better grades. And there's research that supports this. Product design and engineering students realized that sofas were often thrown away after a short time when people got tired of the color or the style. So they've started a company called Sofa for Life, which is now working with IKEA. And the idea of the sofa is you can replace covers, cushions, legs, arms, but you keep essentially the same sofa life. We work with architecture students looking at things like cross laminated timber which is stronger than concrete and steel and this building is made out of wood. Cross laminated strong timber much better for the environment than steel. Flora Robson again if you click on the link this will take you through to her work and she went up to the forest campus working with the landowner and the staff and students there expressing the local nature and connecting to it and planting trees as part of a project funded us. David Doran, not a GSA student, but imagines futures. And I think we need to imagine positive futures for us all. So his work includes putting up pictures of what things could look like if we got rid of the industry and became more sustainable. Missing Architecture is a GSA um, organization that works with students in bringing other voices into architecture, women, uh, black architects, Asian architects, to talk to students, to show them the diversity that there is in architecture and the fact that we need more. Clavmag is a queer uh, website, a magazine, uh, looking at what uh, queer theory can do for environmental and social justice. So queer theory is about disruption and disrupting how we think. And it's very useful when looking at design, building and art and actually challenging accepted views. 
we said architecture is a group of second year architecture students who ran a conference in spring 2020 and they are looking at bringing in other voices and other more environmental ways of building buildings and this is student run and Anne louise graham is a recent graduate and you've also got a link there for best practice uh, student blogs with over 80 uh, examples of student work which you can look at the gsa library has started looking at its reading lists which are overwhelmingly white writers and white authors and male authors and male writers and the alternative reading list you can add to you can suggest books and they will buy books that you want to see in the library there's 60,000 books many written by white men and we're changing that to be more representative of the knowledge globally i want to talk about your individual responsibility if some of the things i've talked about today are overwhelming i want to say you have limited responsibility you have limited impacts you are one of 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet. Your role is to look at what you can do professionally to address your impacts and maybe have a better effect, positive effect on the planet. So as a designer, as an artist, as an architect, you could have a positive effect on what you build and what you design, but your personal responsibility is limited by coming to the GSA, by thinking about these things, you've already fulfilled quite a bit of your responsibility. But by including environmental and social justice issues in your practice, you can have a much more interesting career and get far readier for work than if you didn't look at these issues. They said looking at environmental and social justice issues helps you look much more deeply at your practice and at your study. And I read um, thinkers like Audre Lorde, who's a black lesbian feminist, and she spoke about the fact that we need to make new structures and think about what works and what doesn't. And I would recommend reading uh, writers like Audre Lorde. And if you click on the link, you'll go through to some of her work. It's important that we care for each other and we have compassion for each other and be kind to each other at this time. And that major part of sustainability is looking after the self. It's not selfish look after yourself first, do what you need to look after yourself. Then you can look after others. Then you can look after wider nature. So be compassionate. If you click this link, you'll go through to our well-being resources. Think about meditation, yoga, Tai Chi. Think about what you can do to actually connect back and relax and give yourself time between work. Be part of a community project. For example, we have litter picks. You can go to beach cleans. And these are ways to connect to people, uh, not necessarily for solving a waste issue because there'll be more waste brought in by the next tide. But what it will do is allow you to connect to local people and actually start discussing these issues and how we can start thinking about not making plastics, not making wrappers, thinking about packaging, thinking about the big issues we need to change and the potential, the jobs, the careers, the benefits of doing that. We put on films, you can suggest films. We have Blood in the Mobile, which is about the effects of making mobile phones. River Blue, fashion industry, how it changes the colors of the river in India when they're making clothing because the color literally leaches out of the factories into the river and it was blue. Blue, blue was in fashion the year they made the film. We have thinkers like Satish Kumar and designers like India Flint come to the GSA. And again, we can help you bring speakers to the GSA to talk to us. Now, the link on the bottom right is about one-to-one -one support. And we have regular sustainability group meetings and we are also available for one-to-one -one support. So we can meet you individually. We can also get involved in your project work. We can come and talk to your class. We can have a discussion about these issues. You can read about our policy and strategy. We also supply, supply more advice, support and funding. And we also have campaigns like uh, asking people to switch to uh, different kinds of paper and saving energy. There's lots of organisations in Scotland, I've mentioned Missing in Architecture, but you may be interested in CEDA, which is the Scottish Ecological Design Association. The psychology work I've talked about came through my working with Climate Psychology Alliance Scotland. We support the climate strikes. We support student groups like Responsive Art and Design Society. We take part in events like Architecture Fringe. And we have a group called EAUC Scotland, which supports my work 
and environmental and social justice and support staff and students around Scotland. I would recommend Donut Economics, which was the original graphic I showed with the donut and the planetary boundaries by Kate Raworth. And I would also recommend a book in the GSA library called Engaging with Climate Change, edited by Sally Waintrow. And this is a mixture of voices talking about why we deny climate change and what we can do about it. The best place to be and the reason why I work at the GSA is because the studio and GSA is the place where we will solve these problems. Try not to be overwhelmed by the issues, but actually work out which part of the system you can change and think about systems changes, not about minor changes. Don't tweak the system, change the system. And here at the GSA, we officially, in our official strategy, we ask you to be disruptive, ask questions, make the big change. You can contact me on this email address and also we have a sustainability Facebook. Thanks for listening and please do enjoy your time at the GSA.